Hello and welcome to The Bike Show, which is, once again, coming to you from Italy. Behind us is a very red wall, and that in Italy can only mean one thing, and that is Ducati. This is the Ducati factory, and in there is the Ducati Museum, and we're going to take you on a bit of a guided tour. The Ducati story starts not with motorbikes, but with radio. Marconi, the inventor of radio telegraphy, came from Bologna, and Adriano Ducati obviously caught the bug, and he patented a short-wave transmitter. In 1926, he and his brothers uh, formed a company to manufacture radios, optical equipment, and other electrical goods. That only came to an end in 1944, when the Allies bombed their hell out of the factory and raised it to the ground. After that, they rebuilt, and there starts the proper Ducati story that we know today. So, 1946, the Second World War has ended. They've got a bombed-out factory. They used to make electrical goods. Now that changed. The demand was for cheap mass transportation. So they built this little single-cylinder engine, 48 cc's, with a huge one-and-a-half horsepower. And what do you do when you've got a little engine? Well, you strap it to a bicycle. I say bicycle, what a lovely thing. It's even got front and rear suspension. And there you go, you've basically got your first mass-produced Ducati motorbike. Now, Ducati is all about racing, and they started racing from the beginning. The Cucciolo was almost immediately turned into a race bike. This is the 1947 Cucciolo 50cc race bike. They had all sorts of racing success right up into the 50s until they moved across to this. This is the Grand Sport. Well, it started as 100cc in 1955, became a 125 in 1956, and again, carried on racing success. And you'll also notice they started using the name Ducati on the tank. Then we come across to this, the Beel Bero. What's significant about this, it's a 1956 125cc racer, but it's the first time Ducati used their famous Desmodronic system. And it's, it's the same system they've been using, well, until now. Into the late 1950s and early 1960s, and racing is becoming increasingly important for the Ducati factory. This particular bike was ridden by Mike Hellwood to victory in the 1959 Ulster Grand Prix. But we moved to 1971 for the really significant development when Taglioni designed a 500cc L-twin race bike engine. In 1969, the world of motorcycles had something of a shock. The Japanese arrived in force, particularly in the shape of Honda and its CB750. It kind of shook up the world. But a natural answer for the Italians and for Ducati was to take the V-twin, the 500cc V-twin that Harry's just shown you, and enlarge it and make this, the first of their famous Ducati street bikes. It's a 750. It's full of engineering goodness, but I don't care about any of that. Just look at the flake paint job. You might recognize this, it's a scrambler. Yes, the original scramblers. They started in 1962 when an American importer asked for something more kind of off-roady. And it's just, look at the lifestyle here. Look at everything. It's just so, oh man, I just love to be there. And look at the styling of this machine. I mean, it is a scrambler and the current scramblers they have now really do look just like this. Okay, well, this has got one cylinder, but you know, two is better than one. And I just, oh, to be alive at this time must have been the best thing ever. In 1979, and yet another milestone for Ducati. We've still got the V, or L twin, but now the valves are driven by a rubber belt. But what's more important was the frame, because the panther here marks the first appearance of Ducati's famous trellis frame. Let's move on to the 1980s, and what we have here is a significant development for Ducati in many ways. It's the Peso 750. It was named after an Italian racer who died at Monza in 1973, it's actually the first bike that was designed by a certain Mr. Tamburini for Ducati, and as you know, he went on to make significant models in the future. But guess what? It's also the first time that Ducati officially adopted the color red. Now, we all know about the Ducati Multistrada, but that wasn't Ducati's first look into the world of adventure. I mean, look at this thing. It is. Well, technically it's a Kajiva. It's called the Kajiva Elephant, but it was engineered by Ducati. That's a Ducati motor 
Ducati frame. Look, it even says Ducati on it. And they entered the Dakar on all sorts of rally races with these things from 1984. It even took victory in 1990 and 1994. What I love about this thing is, I mean, <laughs> yeah, times were a bit different then. I mean, look at this. This is the number board on the side. Obviously, they had to make a plan, so the number is written in here <laughs> in Koki. And then you have a look over here at his navigation. I mean, the last one says, the beach, bravo. I love that. I, I, hope, I wish they would do that now. It could be argued that this particular bike here is the, the genesis of the modern era of Ducati superbike production racing. This is a 900 SS race prepared for the great Mike Hellwood. He raced this when he came back from racing after an 11 year layoff to the 1978 TT in the Isle of Man and he actually won the F1 race. This is a legendary bike ridden by a legendary rider. But what I love about it is this, it's a tennis ball with the top chopped off and a bit of foam rubber in there. I've got absolutely no idea what it's for, but I think it's wonderful. We all know Ducati is synonymous with World Superbike Racing and the World Superbike Championship, well, that started way back in 1988. It happened to be when Ducati had just brought out the 851 with its new four valve motor. Lucinelli proved in that first year, 88, that it was a proper bike, it won races. But by 1990, Raymond Roche, on this very model, managed to win the title for the first time. On that winning note, we shall leave the Ducati Museum because it's time for an ad break. But don't worry, we'll be back later in the show with the rest of our tour. We're at the Ducati Museum at the factory in Bologna, and we rejoin our tour with Don, who is with perhaps the most famous Ducati model of all time. Then after the 851 came the 888, and then in 1992, this, it's the 916. This particular one, the Senna version, very, very rare. You know what, this is the exact motorcycle that got me into absolutely loving superbikes, to be in a race, to wanting to be a racer, to wanting to ride motorbikes, it's this motorcycle. This is the definitive Ducati superbike. Just, just look at it. I have to admit something now, I've never actually ridden one of these, uh, and I'm never going to. I want to own one one day. If I do get hold of one, I'm going to park it in my garage. I'm never going to ride it because, you know, you don't meet your heroes, and I'm going to keep that memory I have of what it's like to ride as a child. And of course, they brought these to the racetrack, and, um, well... The 90s and the early 2000s were the years of the 900 series race bikes. There was Foggy's amazing invisible 916. We had Corsa also on a 916. We had Bayliss on a development of the 916, which was the 996. And then came the 999, with championships for Hodgson, for Bayliss, and for Tosland. It was a fantastic race bike, but it didn't do nearly as well on the road or in the public perception as the earlier bikes. And I don't really know why, because it is utterly gorgeous and it was massively successful. All that racing success is all well and good, but ultimately it's designed to do one thing, and that's sell motorbikes. Thing is, you can't sell lots of those superbikes because, well, they're just too expensive for mere mortals like me. What you need is a more affordable jobby, and that jobby is this, the first of the monsters. 1994, it came along, and it marks a significant shift for Ducati. Simple, but very effective, and like I said, affordable. And then the 2000s happened, in particular 2003, where Ducati entered MotoGP with this, the 990 Desmo Sedici. This is the bike ridden by Loris Caparossi. And just look at it. What amazes me is how kind of wide it is, you know, with the holes in it and all that kind of thing. It's, I mean, it's only, what, 15 years old, but it really looks quite archaic, especially when you compare it to this, which is just four years later. This is Casey Stoner's 800cc Desmo Sedici, because in 2007, Dorna decided they wanted to slow the bikes down on the straights, so they made them 800s and they went faster in the corners, which is, I don't know, someone was taken out the back of Dorna and shot, I think, for that. Something else interesting, and I don't know if you can actually see this on your screen, but in real life, this bike is actually sort of a, almost sort of pinkish color, whereas this one is kind of a burnt orange. And if you look at the bike of Davizioso, the modern MotoGP bikes, they're almost kind of like an orange color. The reason for that is because of the cameras they were using at the time. Ducati wanted them to appear 
Indicatorit on television, not in real life. So they painted the bikes based on what they look like in TV. And of course, with the progression of TV and HD and all that kind of stuff, the colors of the bike actually changed. That's very Italian. The 999, as we've already established, wasn't a great commercial success. So for the next bike, Ducati came up with this, the 1098. Single-sided swing arm, much better looking, and according to some, much better to ride. Here, however, we have what Ducati have become rather famous for, very limited edition, very expensive specials. This is a Desmo Sedici double R, based on the MotoGP technology. It is utterly gorgeous, but it wasn't very nice to ride. 2010, and the customer is getting ever more demanding. So what did Ducati do? Well, they bring this, the Multistrada. Why is it so special? Well, according to them, four bikes in one. Street, touring, sport, and enduro. And I have to say, much as it pains me, bloody brilliant. Now, of course, we can't have racing without protection, and we all recognize this. This is a racing suit, more specifically, the one for Casey Stoner. And it is more or less what we have today, except, well, typically it looks like it was designed for a child, not a proper man at all. You know? <laughs> um, and then we have this one, this is Troy Bayless, and you can see they started using, should we say, external protection, all the titanium and plastic and all sorts of things, compared to this. This is Carl Fogarty's suit, and it's all sort of very internal. Well. Talk about internal, have a look at this. This is 1975, it's Franco Ancini, the bloke, by the way, who designed Pekisa. He is a MotoGP safety officer at the moment. I don't know why, because this does not look very safe. But importantly, it appears to have two zips on the hips, which I presume are for his hip flask and his cigarettes or something. But here is the genesis of the race suit as we know it today. In the mid-1950s, Jeff Duke actually had a one-piece leather suit made for him to cut down on aerodynamic drag. This is an Italian rider, his name was Maoggi, and there's really nothing to it. It is just a little bit of leather that stretches over your My skin. My slippers have got more armour than that suit. Well, I mean, look, this is the helmet they used to wear. I mean, look at that. It's just a pudding base, <laughs> yeah, which has been turned upside out. down. Can I just point something out? We all say we're going forward in direction. A lot of hipsters are going to be drilling over there right now. <laughs> so we've gone full circle right back to the <laughs> yes. beginning. And yeah. again, zip so you could carry your fags and your hip flask when you broke down in the middle of the countryside. <laughs> it's only a small museum, but it's reasonably priced, full of amazing bikes, and well worth a visit if you ever find yourself in northern Italy. That's it for the bike show this week. We'll return next week with a visit to Pirelli's specially designed wet weather testing track in Milan. We'll see you then.